We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online. This is one person, one talk series, season two, lockdown 2.0. To, to introduce today's speaker and the moderator, I hand over to Dr. B. Shiv Shankar, President, Indian Orthopedic Association. Thank you very much, Neeraj. Friends, today we have Dr. Rajesh Maniar from Leelawati Hospital, who will be talking about platform rotating platform technology in the current arthroplasty. It is analysis over the last 30 years. We have pa panelists in the form of Dr. Unmesh Mahajan from Nagpur, Dr. Shiv Kumar Santapure from Aurangabad, Dr. Asit Chidgupta from Sholapur, and Dr. Shivanand Bandekar from Goa. We also have the technical help from Ortho TV in the form of Dr. Neeraj Bijlani, Dr. Ashok Sham, and Supriya. To introduce, to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rajesh Maniar. He has done MS Ortho from Bombay, FCFCS, FCPS Ortho. Then he went to Liverpool for his MCH Ortho. Then after coming back, he has completed his DNB Ortho also. He has done his joint replacement fellowships in New York, Boston, Regional Orthopedic Center, Essex in UK, Royal Liverpool Hospital in United Kingdom. He won the Norman Roberts Medal for the best thesis on isotope bone scanning in hip replacement in patients uh, during his uh, MCH period. He has also worked under Dr. C.S. Ranawat at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. He's a postgraduate teacher for DNB since 2013 at Leelawati Hospital. And his two innovative videos are part of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons teaching library. That is, the one is on bone grafting technique during total knee replacement. Another one is lateral retinal, retinacular release for patellar maltracking. Friends, he has over 50 publications in many reputed international journals. He has done demonstration surgeries not only across India, even at many conferences in Malaysia, China, Philippines, etc. It's not progressing. Slide is not progressing. Step on the slide. You know, I don't know what happened. Share. Yeah. He has done over 8,000 surgeries at Breach Candy Hospital and Leelawati Hospital, etc. At present, he is working as the head department of orthopedics at Leelawati Hospital and Research Center in Bandra, Mumbai. He is the past president of and founder member and trustee of ISHK, that is Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgery. He is also international member for Knee Society of North America. Well, Rajesh Maniar. In the panel, we have Onmesh Mahajan, who has also done MS Orthopedics from Mumbai and MCH from Liverpool. He is practicing at Nagpur since 2003 in the specialty orthoplasty. He is the pioneer in computer-assisted navigation in TKR in Central India, one of the largest users of rotator, rotating platform design in Tibia. Onmesh. We have Dr. Shiv Kumar Santapure from Aurangabad, who has done his MS Auto from GMC Aurangabad. He was trained at Bombay Hospital and Leelawati Hospital between 1999 to 2001. He has done two years of international fellowship at Mount Sinai Hospital in Baltimore in between 2001 and 2002. During that, those two years, he worked under Dr. Palais, Michael Mount, John Hazenberg, Charles Taylor, and Ponsetti. Friends, we all know they're all the leaders in their own respective fields like joint replacement, deformity correction, and pediatric orthopedics. He is working at present at Kamala Nayan Bajaj Hospital and Marathwada Medical Research Institute in Aurangabad. And he has recently started in 2013 his own hospital. He has done over 10,000 major orthopedic surgeries, including over 3,000 joints. He 
also visits as a consultant at Iraq and Yemen, and he also does surgeries there. The next panelist we have is a young surgeon from Tolapur, Asit Chidgupta. He is working at Tolapur for the last 10 years as joint replacement surgeon. He has worked as senior registrar with Dr. Pradeep Bosle in KM Hospital. He is trained under Dr. Raj Gopal at Delhi. He, is visiting, he has also done the visiting fellowship at National University Hospital Singapore and also Abu Dhabi under Dr. Charles Brown for arthroscopy in 2016. He has also worked as a visiting fellow at Royal Orthopedic Hospital in Birmingham in 2017 for revision replacements. Friends, he is an expert TKR surgeon. The confidence can be seen by his own father, an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Shekhar Chidugupkar, undergoing bilateral TKR by his son, Dr. Asit Chidugupkar. He is also a Rotarian. He has visited Rwanda and Gabon on Rotary Mission as orthopedic surgeon to carry out surgeries there. Welcome, Dr. Asin. Friends, the last person we have on the panel is Professor Dr. Shivanand Bandekar from Goa. He has also done MS Orthopedics and MCH Orthopedics. He works as the professor and head at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery in Goa Medical College. He is also Dean and Medical President of Goa Medical College. <laughs> is Dean Faculty of Medicine, Goa University. He is Dean and Director of Institute of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, that, that is IPHB in Goa. He is also Director of SOTO, that is State Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization. Friends, you can see my mobile number, WhatsApp mobile number is flashing. If you have any question during the talk, you can send me a WhatsApp message. I welcome Dr. Rajesh Maniyar, Dr. Unmesh Mahajan, Dr. Shivkumar Santpuri, Dr. Asit Chirukta, Dr. Shivanand Bandekar, Dr. Neeraj Bidlani, and Dr. Ashok Sham for today's webinar. And I hand over the mic to Dr. Rajesh Maniyar for his talk on rotating platform technology in current orthoplasty with his 30 years of experience. Over to you, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, it is a great honor to be be part of the faculty at this uh, series that is going on for more than a year and really been extremely educative and popular. Uh, I'm thankful to you for giving me this opportunity as well as to the uh, Ortho TV doc, uh, organizers, Dr. Bijlani and Dr. Ashok Shyam. I'm also thankful to the um, my moderators who are all well versed with the mobile bearing and, and I would be very happy to have the discussion as we go along. As you mentioned that the talk is going to be one hour, half an hour discussion. What I would propose is that I'm going to take you through in last 30 years, how I have evolved and what I have thought about the mobile bearings in total knee. that I would break at certain points and then we can have discussion at that point till that part of the topic that is over and then go ahead with the further uh, um, presentation and then maybe stop again at discussions. And of course, yes, any questions will come at any time. If you raise the hand, we will we can discuss that. Um, so I think uh, uh, without further this thing, let's just get on. There's lots to understand about mobile bearing. It is a topic which is uh, less understood because less commonly used. Right. I guess. It's from the trial run, we are a little further ahead. Okay, am I visible at the first slide now? Yes, sir. Okay, so what I'm going to do is give idea about the rotating platform technology in the current arthroplasty practice and how we have reached here from my analysis of knowing this technique and using it for the last 30 years. The most important aspect, I think, is that this technology was introduced way back in 1977. It is in its fifth decade of use, continues to be widely used across the globe. And I think that says the most, that if there is any technique which is in use for 50 years, there has to be some sound principle behind it. And the joint that you see here, the LCS knee, is 
probably the only joint still being used as it was designed in 1977. I don't think we have any other joints which has not which has remained in the same design. They've all gone into the generation one, generation two, generation three, and changes and changes. But this design was solid enough to be continuously used. And I think that the reason behind that was that the rotating bearing principle that it adopted. My experience started in 91, 30 years back when I was in UK for five years um, with the LCS knee, because that was the only rotating platform knee available then. Um, and over the years, then I've used, as you can see here, about 2,000 rotating platform knees in my practice out of about close to 8,000. So about 30% of all the knees that I do are rotating platform, which also means that all the knees are not suited, suitable for rotating platform. And that's because of a lot of deformities and ligament imbalance that we have. And as we go along, we will um, understand this. I also use it in revision TK, and I think if anywhere uh, people would have no doubt using rotating platform, it is the revision TK, and we'll see why. What I like about this statement is that life is leaped forward, but understood backwards, and I think that's what I'm going to do today, that having used this for so many years, I'm going to put my analysis here, and so let us first start from the early evaluation of total knee implants. The first successful knee implants in six, late 60s and early 90s were total condylar, mainly all poly designs. However, there were two issues. One, there was a high incidence of radiolucent lines and second, high incidence of loosening. Why was it so? Because on a flexible plastic platform, tibias were all poly, the load on one side, eccentric load led to lift off from the other side. So the pressures were not evenly distributed. And immediately it was felt that a rigid metal, metal platform would be the right thing to do, where the forces are evenly distributed more or less, and there are no reverse forces to like a seesaw effect. So the next stage of development was to do a metal backing of the TBL component, which progressed in two directions either to make it monoblock or to make it modular. Monoblock implants are the ones where the plastic is fixed to the tibial base plate in the factory itself so that you can't separate it. And the modular ones are where the two pieces come separate like what we use today. Now the problem with the monoblock design was the manufacturing was, was a dilemma because of the number of processes that were required. For each tibia, you would need eight millimeter poly, 10, 12, and there's a limit to how many number of uh, implants they would have to generate. The second problem was the adjustability on the table for surgeon. Many times you would see that after you implanted the uh, tibial base plate, you think that your plastic, maybe it, instead of eight millimeter, you want to put a 10 millimeter, or instead of 10, you probably looks too tight and want to go down. So that adjustability changed if you have a monoblock implant. And therefore it was less favorable. However, many of the monoblock implants were successful like IB1, some of the total condyler with metal back and the in the recent times AGC. However, the problem here is the number of implants that were to be made available was difficult for the manufacturers. So the modular design caught up where the plastics component was separate. It solved the manufacturing problem but it introduced an extra problem, which was an undersurface wear. Till then, we only considered the wear on the superior, super, superior surface, that is between femur and plastic, but now there was an undersurface wear as well. So the modular design progressed in two directions, fixed bearing designs as we use today, most of us, and the second one was the mobile bearing design. So the first mobile bearing design was actually done by Goodfellow and O'Connors in Oxford. And their unicondylar knee is even today popular and commonly used. Of course, it has gone through a number of generations, but Goodfellow has already also designed a total knee with a mobile bearing. However, that did not become successful. 
Simultaneously, Beekel and Papas in New Jersey, in USA, designed LCS knee. And again, they designed uh, three different types of mobile bearing. They made medial and lateral meniscus. These are meniscal bearing with both the cruciate retaining, then the cruciate sacrificing and the rotating platform, and some of the uni. For them, the joint that became most successful was the rotating platform. They, of course, claimed the better knee kinematics because there was now sharing of load with the surrounding soft tissue. With a fixed bearing, the soft tissues are not loaded. With a mobile bearing, like in a normal knee movement with the meniscus moving in rotation apart from flexion and extension, there is going to be load sharing to the soft tissues and ligaments around. Now, what we need to understand about mobile bearing is that all mobile bearings are not the same. Basically, there are two types. One is a unidirectional mobile bearing and second is the multidirectional mobile bearing. And we'll come to that in a while. The unidirectional rotating platform are usually the unidirectional. The one experience that I have had in this 30 years is with the unidirectional rotating platform, except in the first few years, we also used meniscal bearing, which were multidirectional, but uh, of the LCS knee, but that never became so much popular. But it's the rotating platform that I've had extensive um, experience with and is what we are going to talk about. The multidirectional mobile bearing loses a lot of advantages of the rotating platform unidirectional mobile bearing and are therefore not so very popular. Many of them have already been given up. So let us now understand, having understood the evolution, what, why is this polyethylene wear uh, an issue? I think polyethylene wear was an issue with the total hips. It took a number of years to get a correct poly to get in, increase the lifespan of a total hip. Same thing has happened to the knee. The plastic itself, when it rubs against metal, it is going to wear. The manufacturer's recommended limit for the industrial use when you have a uh, high-density polyethylene is the load of 10 megapascal. For the joint replacement, the design limit is lower and it should be 5 megapascal. Now, if you look at the, the wear in the total knee, it, it can occur at three different levels. One is the articular surface. That is between the femur and the liner. Second is the undersurface. That is where the liner is fixed onto the tibial base plate. And the third, if it is a cruciate sacrificing posterior stabilized knee, then on the post where it articulates with the femur, that post can wear as well. I'll, let us look at each one of them separately. Between the femur and the tibial liner, this wear is inversely proportional to the contact area between the two. So if you have a larger contact area, there will be less wear and tear. You can see here, these are the three fixed bearing designs which have a smaller area of contact and each one of them have a correspondingly higher wear, which is definitely much higher than the permissible level of even 10 megapascal. This is the design, which is a very good contact area, high congruency, high contact area, and therefore low contact stress below the five megapascal. That's the mobile bearing knee. That's the rotating platform mobile bearing knee. Now, why does that, why, why we can't design a fixed bearing with a larger co contact area? And so that is why to understand that, here is a two fixed bearing designs. Here one where there is a smaller area of contact, here one there is a larger area of contact. Now see what happens here is that you have a very good mobility. There is high contact stress because there is a small area of contact but there is a low constraint force because it will allow it not only to do flexion extension, but slide from front to the back, medial lateral, even rotate. All those movements are permitted. And therefore, there is the constraint is very little, which is required for a knee movement. It is not just a hinge that we are dealing with. But now the price is there is a high contact stress at one spot, and therefore, there is going to be a high wear and tear in this area where there is a contact. Now, if you design it differently, where you give a complete good contact, now there is a low, low contact stress. The stresses are low. However, the constraint is high. That means all other movements which the body wants to do, sliding and rotation, cannot occur. And all of those are transmitted to the fixation on the tibia or femur, therefore leads to loosening. And so there is a kinematic conflict. 
between contact stresses and constraint forces as, as regards fixed bearings are concerned. Now, what happens in a rotating platform? Here, the movements are dissociated. The flexion extension occurs at the superior surface so that there is a very good contact area and therefore low con contact stress. At the under surface, the rotation is permitted, which is what the body needs to do. And therefore, there is a second articulation that is generated where the rotation occurs, first articulation flexion extension occurs and a, maybe a little bit of sliding. But consequently, here we have a kinematic agreement between the context stress and constraint forces, both are low. And this was studied in various uh, lab analysis and in wear retrieval analysis that the wear with the mobile bearing was extremely low to the extent of 0 0.043 or 0 0.026 millimeter per annum, far lesser than what we even see in a total hip. And this is a lab analysis showing that rotating platform had almost seven times less wear rate compared to the contemporary fixed bearing implants. And this is in my practice. In the early years, we saw a lot of fixed bearings coming back in just a few years with a lot of wear and tear. You can see the line scratching here or on one side because of the load. Whereas here, this was retrieved for infection at five years. You can see there's just no evidence of any wear going on in this rotating platform implant. Let us understand what is under surface wear. That occurs between tibial liner and the tibial base plate. Here is a patient at seven years, fixed bearing knee, has produced severe osteolysis. And if you look at the articular surface, has some amount of wear, nothing significant, but it all came from this movement that was occurring at the under surface. You can see that the locking mechanism has not been very solid. And the under surface is like a generation of the um, uh, particle generating machine, which is what led to this osteolysis in just seven years. Parks and others have studied that whether you use one or a different type of a locking mechanism to lock your insert onto the tibia, they will all continue to have sufficient motion at the undersurface, which can create fretting wear. No locking mechanism was solid. Even as little load as 100 Newton, far less than what we normally go through in the body can produce micro motion at the undersurface. And not only that, within the same design of the implant, there was variability with different <clears throat> pieces. That, so this was not uniform. Here is another interesting study which found that the implant which was outside, not implanted, there was, although you locked it, your insert, there is a undersurface movement of a, say 64 units. But the same implants, three years, five years, whenever was revised, the undersurface mobility had increased six or seven times. This were, of course, failed once, so maybe there was an increased mobility. They also looked at the autopsy retrievals, where there was no failure of the joint, but still the undersurface movement had <clears throat> increased tremendously. What it means is that the fixed bearing implants are not completely fixed to begin with. And as time goes, they actually become more and more mobile because that is what the body wants. You need mobility, not only in just flexion extension in other directions too. Vasilevsky looked at his study with 67 implants, which were retrieved and found that longer the duration the implant was in, in vivo, higher was the undersurface wear. And this was statistically significantly correlated with the grade for undersurface uh, wear and osteolysis. There were a number of studies that came out in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000, which showed osteolysis, which was a significant problem with various types of fixed bearing implants, leading to a very high incidence of revision surgery. From Dr. Rana was saying, Rodriguez published this, where all poly had no osteolysis, the metal back modular six knees had undersurface wear and all leading to osteolysis. 
Now we would think why this undersurface wear is not a problem with the rotating platform. Now that is because of two reasons. One is that rotating platform were traditionally made from chromium cobalt in order to make them very well finished, completely polished, which has very little roughness. Whereas fixed bearings were all manufactured with titanium and unpolished had a lot of roughness. So any undersurface movement led to high wear and tear. Now that would still continue when you make it into a chromium cobalt. However, the second reason, which is probably today appears to be a more important reason is that the rotating platform has unidirectional movements at both the surfaces. At the, I'll come to that in a little while. How does the unidirectional and uh, multiple directional movement uh, affect? But basically, in a fixed bearing, all the movements are occurring, flexion, extension, rotations, and sliding occurring at the same level, and therefore leads to extremely high wear and tear. Whereas with rotating platform, only flexion extension is occurring at the top level, and at the undersurface, only rotation is occurring. So these are called unidirectional movement at two surfaces, and they reduce the wear. So overall, with LCS rotating platform, over the 20 years, the survivorship was anywhere between 91 and 100 percent with all the different studies. Even our study was published with uh, more than 10 years. I'll present that in a minute. But when we look at the incidence of osteolysis, that was extremely small in the LCS rotating platform means, even at between 12 to 20 years. Compared to fixed pairing, this was extremely small. And thus, the rotating platform started getting attention in the late 1990s because of the lesser articular surface wear, lesser undersurface wear, better kinematics, and excellent long term results. And this led to development of rotating platform implants because almost every company in that time started making the rotating platform. You can see that the first two were Oxford and LCS in 77 and 78. Then there was a big lull. But in 1990s and even in the early 2000s, almost each and every company wanted to make a rotating platform implant. And a lot of them did. However, they could not replicate what was for LCS because of the patent reason. And most of them failed because they didn't realize that it was the unidirectional rotating platform that work. So probably none of these are today in market, uh, except a few. But the LCS legacy continued because Depu was taken over by j and and they merged their two philosophies and developed the rotating platform LCS knee into further designs, which I'll talk to you. But first, I'll present to you the LCS experience of mine. I did 55 knees. In India, I have done about 51 knees in England before I came here. I kept a strict records for each patient having come from Dr. Anawat's uh, um, Institute and from Boston. I kept a very, very close knee society scores and the follow-up and the patient records. So we presented our about 12 and a half year results on an average with LCS knee in the IJO, there were 55 knees, 98% of the patients were surviving. There was no osteolysis, and average range of movement was 101 degrees with those implants. The knee scores and function score improved greatly, like any other total knee. Average range of movement was 105, but the range was from 90 to 130. Now, I had selected then only young, active, and heavy because LCS knee is more demanding to put, it does not have a post, and it has a possibility of spinning out from its position. So you really need a very tight ligament balance. But I did it in many of the heavy patients. This is one of them, about 135 kilo patient. This is her at three and a half years. These are her X-rays at 13 years. These are her X-rays at 20 years. You can see no evidence of osteolysis, both implants are doing well. In fact, she is today 22 years. I just spoke to her last week. She's in Kenya, 83 now, around 83. And she, is, she remains mobile, no complaints with the knee. And, and I get amazed looking at these knees again and again. These are some of the other 
both are now 20 years, but you see their 12 and 13 year X-rays, there's just no evidence of osteolysis or any issue at the interface between the implant and the bone. This young patient, rheumatoid, I had done all four joints. This is at 18 years, her knees remain fine. Another RA patient, again, I've done all her four joints. This is at 18 years. Now, I have had this spin out what I talked to you about in one patient with the LCS knee. And I think this is an important aspect to understand because the ligament balancing is extremely important. Case selection is very important. Probably for this patient, the case selection was not very ideal. She had a severe virus with a, already a sublux knee. But I did decide to put a... Um, LCS loading platform knee, which dislocated. That means the bearing spun out. I revised it with a thicker dip dish uh, bearing, which continued to work for three years, but it spun out again. And then I had to revise it with a uh, fixed bearing revision system. So that was the one case which I had of a spin out. But what LCS did for me was better understanding of the knee kinematics. It refined my technique of ligament balancing even for the fixed bearing knees. It gave me confidence in treating younger and heavier patients. And as I said, it improved my technique with fixed bearing. I became much tighter in doing my ligament balancing. But there were some drawbacks. That is why I moved on. I wanted to, the technology was good, but there were two issues with the LCS. One was the incidence of spin out. Not very large in some series more, but as you understand, then it becomes smaller, but still existed. And the second one was that re revolved around the range of movement. The range of movement at the best was about 100, 105, 110 on an average, which certainly is less than what we would like today. And the range of movement was less because the technique was so exacting, your flexion balance really needed to be tight in order to prevent the dislocation of the bearing. And therefore, so that was the price that you paid with that LCS rotating platform design. But the good thing happened that it evolved and Depew merging with the Johnson & Johnson designed this processes into a posterior stabilized rotating platform knee. And I'm going to take a few minutes to explain what is this, uh, what is this merging and what this posterior stabilized rotating platform knee did. So what was done was that the LCS knee, which looked like this, like a total condylar type, there was no post. It was a posterior cruciate sacrificing knee. You had to sacrifice both the cruciates. However, there was no post to stabilize. It was just the design of the articulation that would give the stability. And therefore it had an incidence where the plastic can spin out if your flexion balance, particularly medial lateral balance is not good, not in extension, in flexion, it would spin out. It was evolved into a posterior stabilized with a post in between, which would give you that additional stability. And how did this merging came about? The LCSRP knee, which was in use for two or three decades from 77 to 90s, the IB1 total condylar metal back, PFC, and all they were also posterior stabilized fixed bearing designs were in use for two and three decades. The differences, both were PCL sacrificing designs, but the differences were this. LCS allowed the bearing mobility, whereas the fixed bearing did not allow the bearing mobility, but had a post and cam mechanism. And let us see what is good and bad of both. Both these processes had an excellent survivorship. If you look at the literature, both had more than 90% survivorship in different hands. So what was realized was good for each component and bad for each component in terms of wear issues, in terms of range of movement achieved, in terms of the kinematics, in terms of the bearing spin out. So like, let us look at each one of them. The LCS RP was better in terms of articular surface wear because of the unidirectional movement that I'm talking about here. At the under surface, there is a rotational movement. At the upper surface, there is a one direction movement. Whereas the fixed bearing knees had all the movements occurring at one level with a small contact area and therefore articular surface wear was high. 
in terms of undersurface, again, LCA has had a very good track record because of the polished undersurface, undersurface no locking mechanism, 100% contact between the two surfaces. And for the fixed pairing, that was not the same. The post wear was not an issue with the LCSRP because there was no post, but post and cam was a very major issue with the fixed pairing knees. And I'll show you some slides in regards to that. So this is from Seth Greenwald study. You can see in the full extension in a fixed bearing knee, there is a small area of contact. The post is here, but as your knee rotates, even five or 10 degrees, which happens in the gait cycle and in various activities that we do, there is a contact on the post and there is a pressure which leads to the wear of the post. And this you can see in one of the retrieval in one of my patients. This was a fixed bearing knee, which I revised at 11 years. For the uh, me locking mechanism failing at 11 years, and you can see that the amount of post that has worn out is predicted by Dr. Greenwald. Also, if you look at these studies from um, Dr. Rick Comistek, Doug Dennis, and others, they've looked at the PSRP knee over the years and found that the bearing primarily rotates between the tibia rather than between the femoral and the component. <clears throat> and therefore, femur and the plastic rotates together and therefore there is no post impingement or wear that occurs on the post. Now, what was good about the fixed bearing was that the range of movement was better. Because of the post, there was a directed movement and they had It was 110 to 220 degree range of movement. Also, what was good was the kinematics because there was a consistent posterior femoral rollback. Whereas with LCSRP, you, some of the cases where there was an erratic femoral roll forward. And that is again shown by Doug Dennis and Comistec that if you have a posterior stabilized component, it is the only component which can give you consistent posterior femoral rollback. All others will give you erratic kinematics, at least in some patients. Also, spin out was an issue with LCS, wasn't an issue with the fixed bearing designs. So what was done was the good of LCS RP was merged with the good of PS fixed bearing and the posterior stabilized rotating platform instead of posterior stabilized fixed bearing knee was designed. And here is the, and I wrote a rationale about this in the journal orthopedics in year 2000, why this merging has happened. And, and so now this PSRP knee was introduced in USA in year 2000 and in India in 2001. And I started using from 2001. And in the first uh, two years between September 2001 and December 2003, of the 478 total knees that I did, 133, I used PSRP knees. So all the consec consecutive 133, first 133 knee of PSRP, I have been following it up. <clears throat> the single surgeon series, same technique, cemented, patellar resurfacing was done for all. And we started a prospective collection of data then, preoperatively three months, one year, five year, 10 year, 15, 20. In collecting cases, range of movement, outcome questionnaire and radiographs. And kaplan mayer survival analysis was done as an endpoint of revision or need for revision surgery. First, I'll show you some patient. Here is a bilateral TK just at six weeks. You can see a great outcome in terms of mobility, range of movement. Bilateral patient, of course, by then I had started using CAS. These are again some bilateral patients. And so first report we produced was a five-year review of the 118 patients with 133 knee. Three had died and 11 were lost to follow-up. We looked at 104 patients with 118 knees. A lot of these lost to follow-up patients were from out of India and we just couldn't trace them. All Indian patients were really traced. And so we published that report in Journal of Arthroplasty um, with 100% survivorship, no spin out, no evidence of osteolysis, average knee flexion of 120 degrees, much better than LCS knee. Now the range up to 155. 34% of the patient 
had more than 130 degree flexion and 67% of the patient could sit cross-legged. And these are some of the patients I showed you earlier, bilateral TKI at 13 years, again with the rotating platform technology, you can see the pristine joints at that length of time. Here is another gentleman, extremely active with both sides, PSRP knees. Even now at 84, he remains very active. Then we looked at their, the same cohort we studied at 10 years. For 10 years, now we had 21 people who had died and the loss to follow up remained same. As I said, they were all out of India patients. We couldn't test them. So the final cohort of 86 with 97 knees with a radiological review for 88 knees. Average follow-up was 11.1 years. And you can see here the knee society score, which had improved at 10, five years, continues to be maintained. The function score went down a little because the patients are getting older, but the range of movement had actually further improved at 10 years. There was no infection, no spin out. Patellofemoral symptoms occurred in 7.2% of the patient, which is comparable to any other posterior stabilized implant. No revision surgery had been undertaken then. Now in 2023, 2023, we are going to be 20 years for that particular cohort and I would be closely following them up then. For 10 year review, there was no osteolysis, no radiolysis line and kaplan mayer survivorship remained 100%. So this is the 10 uh, to 13 year result. Again, was published in Journal of Arthroplasty with 100% survivorship. Uh, some amount of decrease in the activity because as the population gets older. There was also a 10 year report from uh, Dr. Ranawat's uh, uh, institute with the same implant. Again, 97 excellent survivorship. Uh, if Revision is any reason, but if only for the mechanical reason, 100%. No spin out, no osteolysis. Those are the two most important things. Now, <clears throat> and there were many other institutes which had a decade of experience with this posterior stabilized rotating platform. So let us just look at a few of them in terms of laboratory, kinematic, and clinical experience. One of the more, most important lab analysis was this that the same implant PFC Sigma fixed bearing had higher wear rate compared to the R RP in the laboratory. You can see four times higher wear rate. Same implant, same plastic, same design of femur, except the mobility of the plastic allowed. And what was more important is this, the functional biological activity. It is, it is not just the number of particles, it is their activity that actually counts, which was much lower in the rotating platform. Kinematic studies from different groups, from Japan here, from USA here, concluded that consistent and more femoral rollback occurs with the posterior stabilized rotating platform knee. And I, I explained that in my rational uh, article, that why does that occur? Here you can see that the, with a post and cam, at about 70 degrees, the post and cam comes into contact, where the contact area is in the middle of the articular surface. As you go into further flexion, because of the post and cam, the contact area now moves posteriorly. And as you see here in a almost deep flexion, 120 degrees, the contact area is right at the back, which is what happens with the normal knee, that there is a posterior rollback as the flexion progresses. And this you can see in some of my x-rays here, in full flexion in this patient, one of my patients, you can see that the contact has moved all the way back and there is no more erratic movement going forward. It's okay. And the studies <clears throat> showed that now the range of movement with the posterior stabilized RP was comparable, much better than LCS, and was comparable to the fixed bearing posterior stabilized designs. And these are various studies which again showed the same that the range of movement with the two design now was equal. So now you have a rotating platform technology and a better range of movement as well. These are some of the other studies which showed the same that the RP and the fixed bearing posterior stabilized design had the same range of movement 
which was really an improvement over the LCS. So now what we have with the posterior stabilized rotating platform design is there is an improved stability, there is improved flexion, and there is low wear. So I think it's sort of a win-win situation and number of studies showed, including ours, that there was no spin out. Large area of contact, unidirectional movement and post wear, all of them led to the <clears throat> uh, further interest in the rotating platform. Now, I just wanted to touch on this unidirectional movement before we stop for a little bit of discussion. We know that ultra high molecular polyethylene kinematics are such that it orientates itself in the principal direction of sliding. Its strength increases parallel to the sliding, but reduces at 90 degrees to that. Therefore, when you have a situation where there is only one directional movement, unidirectional movement, the wear is minimum. But when you have multiple direction movement, the wear starts increasing. And if the multiple directional movement is of equal magnitude in all direction, then the, it's going to be the highest wear and tear. And this has been shown in the laboratory by Professor Fisher that unidirectional mobile bearings have the least wear, whereas the multidirectional have a very high. And this is an important consideration that allowing rotation is vital to reduce the wear, but it should be allowed in the unidirectional because there are mobile bearings and mobile bearings like this one. This is a design where instead of a post going into the metal like that and allowing the rotation, there's a projection on the metal up and the plastic not only rotates, it slides in front and transversely, these joints really had a severe wear and tear and many of them are given up. Um, maybe I can, I can go a little further and then stop and we can have a little discussion. The, what is important to understand is that as RP was evolving all these years, even fixed bearing was improving. It's not that there was a standstill. There was an improvement in the poly sterilization. There was an improvement in the quality of the poly. There is improvement in the tibial finish and improvement in the locking mechanism also. But we need to study that further. Here, we can see that the uh, when they started doing cross-linking, the wear and tear of the plastic reduced significantly. When further, the locking mechanism improved, I2 locking, second generation locking mechanism, extra cross-linking, and the TBL base plate became uh, cobalt chromium rather than titanium in fixed bearing, the wear rate further reduced. But it is not just the decreasing wear, it is the size of the particle that is more important, as I mentioned earlier, biologically active more with the high cross-link polyethylene. And this all needs to be studied over a period of time. But even we, if we accept that all this has decreased the fixed bearing wear and tear, if you carefully see, it is still double than the, that of the RP. RP wear rate is still much smaller without having to do any of this. And you can improve plastic here also and cross-linking the wear here will go even further it still remains that the rotating platform is going to have better contact area, better kinematics and low wear rate. If you look at this study, MRI at 10 years, Dr. Ranaut showed that between fixed pairing, all poly and RP, there was a significantly higher uh, um, synovitis assessed on MRI with fixed pairing and all poly designs. And they had osteolysis, whereas none of the RP patient had osteolysis. And I see this in many of my patients because I use both the implants. If a patient's second knee was not suitable for rotating platform, I put fixed pairing in many of this. And I see now many of my patients coming between 10, 15, 20 years. Here is one such patient. On right side, I put a PSRP knee, which is 17 years. On the left side, I put a PSFB of the same design, Sigma, same plastic, same design of femur. And you can see that there is hardly any knee swelling here, but a large knee synovitis on the left fixed bearing side, which is, which is what Dr. Ranawat studied and showed. <clears throat> and the meta-analysis of the studies with the LCSRP knees across all the registries where all the knees were used, Swedish knee registry with all the knees, all the fixed bearing knees and rotating platform knees 
was done with 29 reports and it showed that the cumulative revision rate was significantly lower with LCSRP across the studies. And the studies which were published later on, which described survivorship, again, the survivorship was significantly higher with LCS rotating platform designs compared to all other in this registry. So I think overall my analysis is that to avoid all wear related issues in the fixed pairing, which probably because of the improvement in the fixed pairing technology as well, have been pushed from first decade in five, seven, eight years, we show it early, has now become in the second decade, 15 to 20 years. But with our patients becoming younger, we are going to have a long spine um, uh, time of in vivo service required. And therefore, if you want to avoid wear issues in your younger patients with a very active patients over the long time with the fixed bearing, and if you want to have a high performance knee, which is the knee that today, all these three patients are bilateral mobile bearing knees for, done many years back, you should let the bearing rotate. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about the surgical technique, but before that, I think we should take a break. Dr. Siv Shankar, if you think, and we can take some questions. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That will give some rest to your voice also. You can stop <laughs> sharing the screen for a minute. Yes. Any question, Unmesh, Shivanan, so, sir? I would just like to mention one thing. What I'm going to discuss now is the surgical technique. What are the differences? Because I've, I've made a case why rotating platform should be in your armamentarium. And I want people to understand that there's not much difference between the two techniques. I'm going to describe the technique, show some video of uh, that, and then talk about the two newer processes that we use. Um, RPF, we have used some time, and Attune RP. And then the most important last 10 minutes I want to spend on talking about the ro role of the rotating platform in revision knee, which really is the crux today, according to me. Okay, sir, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Yes. Uh, I think uh, Rajesh made a very good case for what I also believe as well. Uh, once you fall in love with the RP design, I think uh, you will be using fixed bearing only under constraint of having a raw use of rod now previously. Now it will change with, with attune, but more or less unless you do use raw, I think you will be using, and if you can get a good, good balancing, I think the crux is balance. If you balance the gaps well, I think the RP design looks pristine at eight, 10 years, now I'm seeing 12 years or so. That's what I believe is pristine looking, perfect looking to be as it was on day one. I, I think that is unmatched compared to any other designs, I suppose. And you know, I think uh, Unmesh, you are absolutely right. The reason for that is that when you have um, uh, the bearing mobility, as it was postulated by Goodfellow and others earlier, that it will start sharing load with the soft tissue. Yes. And also it doesn't stress the tibia yeah. Unevenly, there is uniform, and there is a study from Japan where they have shown that the after putting a fixed bearing knee, if you do BMD in the area around the tibial base plate, there is osteoporosis in certain area, like stress shielding occurring. With mobile bearing, that does not happen. There is a uniform bone still remains around the. Even the radiation lines are less on the tibial side compared to fixed bearing. There's hardly radiation lines seen on the uh, RP designs as such. You mean over the period of time? Because, over the period of time, yes, over right. period of time. because yes. the initial ones would be the same, which yes. is surg surgical technique related when you're cementing. Yes. But, but you're right, yeah. Stress I think, ones doesn't I think with the obese patients, I think the great thing with obesity, yes. I think is one of the best thing to have is a rotating platform. Exactly that, you know, and, and in the initial days, in 95, I'm talking about. Yes. LCS knee was not available then. In 96, I had to really plead to get them in, in India. And, and to put that knee, it was, uh, but it has paid off. Like yeah. that lady I showed you, 135 kilos and 22 years, it is looking pristine. And there are some others. Sir, one question. Yes, yes, Ashit. The buccal papa knees, yes. uh, that has not changed uh, since its inception. And they uh, have given a, a survivorship of 95% at the end of 15 years. Uh, so, what are the reasons that uh, the RF design has changed from uh, the previous design to the uh, current design? Mm -hmm. So, and right. second, so Be Beekle Papas, Beekle Papas are the same people who designed LCS knee. Beekle designed it in 1977, Fred Beekle. And uh, Papas was an engineer. Now, what happened was that in 1990s, they sold their patent to Depu which was then taken over by 
Sigma. So they couldn't manufacture. So they have manufactured the same knee, LCS knee in a different version. And that is Bikil Papa's knee. But that was designed, you know, maybe 15 years back. It's, it's not going on uh, for a longer than that. But, but it is almost the same design as the LCS. And, and, and we, within that, they have a, a, a version of a posterior stabilized because that was the need that was realized that it's just the, you know, I, I've used it. I don't know whether you have used LCS or not. I have, sir. I have yeah, used. so that, that LCS stability was such a concern on the table. And therefore, I think uh, uh, that has changed with the posterior stabilized. So the Beacon Papa also has a posterior stabilized knee. But I think it is exactly same. It is the same design as LCS. It's with some variation to overcome the patent and other things. But by adding a post, did it contribute to more wear with, with, at the post and that junction? Absolutely. There is That's a there, reason why they had to go ahead and change the design later on. So the, the post, the post increases the one area of wear and tear. But you know, like I showed you uh, uh, Rick Comistake and Doug Dennis's uh, uh, study that they've shown that even at 10 years, the femur and the plastic rotate together. And if they rotate together, there is no impingement on the post. The wear on the post occurs in two or three areas. One is because of the impingement in rotation. Second, if you have an hyperextension, right? So that you can't avoid. That's going to happen. That's a surgical technique and you want to make sure that your knee is... Uh, stable and not going into hyperextension. But the rotational wear in a mobile bearing does not occur. However, what happened was that people started making the post fat enough to avoid even virus valgus. And then, then the wear and tear can occur. I, I quite don't remember why they had to change it for whatever reason. I have not used Bikil Papa's knees because I've been using uh, this one, which I'm very happy with. And it's the actually original LCS design. So, I think the post has given uh, more advantage on the shoulder. Posterior stabilized to take the PS out and put a cruciate a PCL uh, retaining uh, rotating platform. Is, is that the way forward? So, posterior cruciate retaining rotating platform is available. There is no doubt, and it works exact, you know, equally well. The um, you know posterior cruciate retaining was a most popular knee at one point of time in America. Then the it went out of the vogue and posterior stabilized started becoming more popular. Then the changes have occurred to the posterior cruciate retaining plastic in that it has become more congruent because now it gives you stability whether your posterior cruciate is available or not. So it's a philosophy. Rotating platform, me, what I'm describing about works with both the cruciate retaining rotating platform where there is no post and the cruciate uh, sacrificing with the post. I have experience with the posterior cruciate sacrificing knees. Okay. I, I strongly believe in that particular, because again, if you go into the fluoroscopic study, the posterior cruciate retaining design at some point of time have erratic kinematics. And they've tried to improve that kinematics by improving the plastic design and making it more curved. The paradoxical movement, the femur goes in front and that is what you want to say. So you are close to that. Correct. I have this uh, buccal papa with me. I've kept it. The second uh, question I wanted to raise was, uh, when we are doing a fixed bearing uh, as against a, uh, a mobile bearing, in a mobile bearing, when I was doing a buccal papa, the first thing was to uh, do the soft tissue releases first. And once the tibia is resected, then there is no scope for soft tissue releases. Because if you do the releases after the resection is done, there is a high chance that it will uh, uh, become unstable. So, uh, whatever oh, yeah. releases have to be done, that those releases have to be done before the uh, cuts are taken. That's right. So, that's what happened with LCS knee, that you do releases first. But, you know, it might work with some of the knees which are not very deformed. It worked with me when I was in England, but I soon realized when I was here that it doesn't work. And, and if you look at, most of us will have a philosophy today mm -hmm. that we would go on doing releases during the operation, remove the osteophytes, remove the posterior osteophyte, release the posterior capsule. We will not touch the MCL till the last moment. And, and you don't want to do it because if you do it at the beginning and suddenly now you find that you have over-released. And so I think that is the reason, you're right, you are absolutely right, they will not allow that and it might work with a very, very 
less deformed and stable knees, but it doesn't work with our uh, deformed knees. Fractional release is the is the word. You do fraction wise release yes. as you require it. And the more you use navigation, I think you also agree, the less release you require because Correct. you require less rotate, you understand more of rotation part and everything. So you do less release as you do without a navigation. So it's a fractional release, which is important stepwise. You can't do it on day one, but step one, all release. I think you can be in a trouble with a bad various knees, with a depression, posterior middle depression, all those things. They will open up like anything in the posterior middle aspect. So, exactly, yes. Okay, Dr. Bandekar, you have any question? Or Dr. Shiv Kumar? Uh, and Dr. Uh, Rajesh, congrats for such a wonderful presentation. Thank yeah, you. my question is, uh, do you do patellar resurfacing in your all RP knees? And uh, do you really allow them to go so so much on uh, flexion mode that is spotting and all is allowed after your uh, yeah. RP is done? So uh, first question, the patella resurfacing, I do it for all the patients, One, almost 100 all maybe, maybe one or two I have not replaced, but otherwise I replace all the patellas. The, okay. uh, uh, that is controversial and I think I'm okay, but I do all. The um, second is allowing them the movement. I think if, if your patient is going to achieve that sort of a movement, then he's going to use it. You can't stop them from using it, but I endeavor, I do everything that I can to get them maximum range of movement with flexion stability. See, there are two things here. If you make yes. your flexion gap loose, you will get a very good range of movement, but that's not a stable knee particularly in activities like getting up from the chair, going up and down the steps or Correct. slightly turning. So I like to maintain my flexion balance and with rotating platform, you really need to be very good. Not as much as LCS with PSRP, but still you need to be a good flexion stability. So if you maintain that, and you know what is very surprising? And again, Dr. Ranawat taught me that, that with a post and cam, if you have a legs flexion gap, you actually get less movement. If you keep a good contact between the post and cam by keeping that flexion tighter, no, I'm not saying tighter than the extension, but relatively tighter, you, it engages and it guides your movement. The post and cam guides your movement to the, and so I let them do it. And I, I don't think there is a worry about the wear and tear because the contact area is good one. And the second is there is a study from Belgium which looked at the contact pressures. As you go into flexion, thigh touches the calf and a lot of the loads are transmitted there and doesn't go to the knee at all. Except for the okay. squatting type. But actual true squatting for the Indian style, style toilet, not many people want to do it. And is not. it's mainly they want to sit on the floor, cross leg or uh, do some of the yoga poses. And uh, most of your patients must be young and active, no? So they they normally demand this squatting after RP knees. So what do you advise them? Oh, I would let them do it. But, but the Indian well, style, I uniformly tell them that that's not a very good idea to do. That you must change. Because that somebody, you have to do it day in and day out. And I don't think uh, it's something that can be changed. Did you get any case of patella clunk in this, in your series? Yes, yes. And, and that is why that 7.2% uh, uh, What was the treatment? Arthroscopic debridement, if, if it is significant. Okay. There are a lot of people who would have some crepitus but not much pain and over the time they get better. You should ask them if they are doing some particular activity which aggravates it going up and down the steps and this and that. Try and avoid that as an exercise. But if it is bothersome, very simple. I do an arthroscopic debridement of the peripatellar fibrosis. And I have a special technique okay. for uh, doing that. And it works. Okay. Yes, I think... Uh, yeah. um, we can continue with that. Yes. Hello. Dr. Uh, now I can hear you. Go on. Yes, yes sir. Can. Yes, first of all, uh, let me congratulate and thank you, Dr. Maniar, sir. Thank you, because I started my journey, uh, I assisted my first knee was uh, with Dr. Maniar at Leelawati, way back in 1999, almost 22 years back. Exactly. And, yes, and we, we miss you and we remember your being there. 
thank you sir thank you and uh, now a few questions sir yes so uh, the slope what happens to the slope the tibial cut so uh, i'll ask two three questions and then you can answer them together sir okay. so normally we would in a fixed bearing knee we would give 3 to 5 degrees of slope so but when we do a rotating platform uh, it has to be neutral we cannot give a slope so uh, does this uh, worry uh, does this decrease the flexion less slope okay. that is one question less slope uh, then then in between few years back johnson and johnson debut came up with first came up with rpf debut came up with rpf then they started promoting rp and then they came up with ps 150 so this was all maybe 8 10 years back and suddenly uh, none of the company guys now they don't talk about this rp rpf rpf and ps 150 so what is it sir they they one day they start promoting something and suddenly after few years they just disappear or they don't talk about this so what is it sir and why this why they are not promoting these good implants okay. so that's it sir all right so i think both your questions will be answered let me go on to my presentation again i'm going to talk on technique both are very relevant questions and yes, um um in brief i can say that the about the implants the uh, they are evolving uh, pfc sigma rp is still available and i use it but it is evolved into attune and now i use attune rp the it has some advantages from that rpf technology i was involved with rpf technology right from beginning and we did a multi center multi country study so i will come with that okay and the technique will tell you the slope regarding the slope so let me go on so dr shivkumar is that okay if i go ahead now yes sir yes 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 thank you sir okay so now the key aspect what are the surgical technique similarities and difference between the two technology so i said selection initially um i looked at young active and heavy patients now i really all the patients i want to put rp knee but on the table i decide except for the severely deformed knees where lot of ligament instability is there or occurs because of my releases then i do not want to use a rotating platform knee which can subluxate or dislocate in in terms of static alignment there is no differences in the knee whether in a coronal or the sagittal alignment wise femur preparations remains exactly the same femoral rotation again you judge exactly in the same way except that you now add and which is very important you can use in your fixed bearing as well is also look at your tibial cut what is your rotation matching with the tibial cut the aim is symmetric flexion and extension gap like in any total knee ligament balancing also steps remain exactly the same the difference is mainly in the tibial preparation tibial cut is always made first even for fixed bearing if i use a fixed bearing knee i do tibial cut first lcs needed a slope of 7 to 10 degrees which was significant and it was an attempt to maintain the patient's natural slope whereas the pfc sigma rp 0 to 5 degree what actually is recommended 0 0 to 2 degrees but i i keep 3 degrees of slope and and that is because the the slope is if you go into shivkumar if you go into a reverse slope situation then you are going to have decreased range of movement and if you are using a conventional technique you will never realize whether from zero you've gone to minus 1 or minus 2 i use navigation and therefore i can be very accurate i go at about 3 degrees because if you are less you're going to jeopardize your flexion movement and therefore i make no change in my fixed bearing pfc sigma or pfc sigma rp i give 3 degree of uniform slope using computer navigation to my tibia rotation of the tibia now can be different it can be matched to the tibial anatomy with fixed bearing we try and match the post 
or the femoral rotation with the tibia. Here you don't because the liner can rotate 10 degrees on either side. So aim is to prevent poly overhang. The flexion balance is crucial. Poly must match the femoral size. I used to initial the cases do sequential cementing when I do, did RP. Today I don't. I, for many years now I cement all of them together. Now it is intraoperative decision for me whether I'm going to put fixed bearing or mobile bearing. It's never a pre-op decision. I keep both the implants ready and all the instrumentation ready. And how I decide, I'll show you here. After I have made a femoral complete preparation, tibial preparation, I put the tibial base plate with the fixed bearing and judge the patient's rotation, uh, the stability in extension and in flexion. In flexion, mainly the rotational stability and then decide. Now in that particular patient, Stability was good, so I put a mobile bearing, put a mobile bearing base plate, try that. And then if it was not good, I would put a fixed bearing knee. This is a fixed bearing preparation. So I'll show you some case example. Here are two cases looking very similar preoperatively. You can't decide that this one is going to have mobile bearing, this one is not. I'll show you both of them. One had mobile and one did not. This is the case one. Where on table, after at that stage of trialing, I can see that my extension balancing is good. But what is crucial is the flexion. Again, flexion balance is also good. And if you see rotation, now I see rotational balance in flexion. Again, you can see the rotation occurring at the undersurface. And, and it is very good stability, even in rotation. So this is the patient where I have decided to go ahead and put the rotating platform knee. Here is the post-op x-ray. Now, the second case, which looked almost similar amount of varus, and here is the extension after my complete cuts and balancing whatever I needed. One millimeter opening on either side in extension. <clears throat> and now we'll look at the flexion. So here is the flexion. Again, varus valgus looks pretty good. But this is, I, this is one thing. The second thing here, no, on the valgus, you can see that there is a little more opening in the posterior medial aspect. And the rotation, the liner is slightly, it's not dislocating, but it has little more movement than I would like. And so in such patient, I would go ahead and put a fixed bearing knee. So this is, this is how I decide today. Here is one patient, probably the video I put here to show you the same, how I go about. This is about 12, 13 degree of varus correcting to 8 degrees. I made my tibial cut, 6 millimeter cut. I'm putting my tensioner inside. These are the computer navigation arrays. All cases I do is with computer navigation from 2004. So now the varus is jumping back into neutral, but it is still going into varus. I'll go ahead and do my femoral preparation. This is the medial ostectomy, trying to reduce the medial uh, varus. This thing, now you can see that there is a even better correction, but still it is jumping into varus from about one degree to four degree of varus. And we cannot let that much amount of varus be. So I'm doing some amount of release. And I go stepwise as uh, Unmesh was saying that you titrate your release. It is, it is better, but still it is jumping into about two or three degree of varus. And I have decided to release a few more fibers. And so now the lateral is about two millimeters, medial is maybe one or two millimeters. And you can see that now I'm going into valgus. I'm opening into valgus from about two degree of varus to two degree of valgus. So that's a good stability for me. And this is in extension, this is in flexion. Of course, I had done this with trialing as well, and therefore I used the rotating platform knee. So Right, now coming to this. Uh, um, <clears throat> so in summary about the technique, I think it is similar. You just need to be more careful about the balancing that you do. And once you start doing it, it becomes a habit. Even for a fixed bearing, you would be careful. Now for the development of the high flex design, it happened because there was a sudden demand around 2000 that people wanted a high flexion activity. And all the knees we had did allow high flexion, but we thought it was not safe because the area, area of contact was very little. So the RPF was designed over PFC Sigma RP. <clears throat> and couple of early studies showed a better range of movement. These are some of my patients. This patient was a yoga teacher doing all with the RPF knee. 
all sorts of different poses, poses and some, some other patients. And we published the results of RPF knee at two to six years in Journal of Arthroplasty. For the, again, these were the first, <clears throat> first group of patients, 53 knees that we, and this was an international uh, cohort study, but I'm presenting here only my 53 cases in Journal of Arthroplasty. 100% survivorship at that short period of time and 81% of the patient could sit cross-legged, 53% could sit on floor, 21% could squat. Patellofemoral symptoms was low. And we've followed up this cohort at 10 to 14 years and current year, it is only last week that our, um, we've read the proof with Indian Journal of Arthroplasty, the same cohort, we've reported again 100% survivorship. No osteolysis, no spin out, but the number of people doing that activity has gone significantly down. That's because the average age of patient now is 79.6 years. And that, that's a pretty old group of patient now. They were 10 years back. They were able to do much more activity, much lesser now. But their knee range of movement actually has increased to 134 degrees compared to the earlier report. However, what is important and why, and this is the reason why your question that uh, the, they, they are not coming out, why those joints are going away, is because of this. That over the 10 years, we realized that whether you have RPF knee or RP, you have an equal range of movement. It did not happen that the RPF knee produced better range of movement. The, both of them together had a better range of movement than LCS. And this is one of the study I published in orthopedics, looking at the range of movement for all the three groups. They were done at different period of time, but we did a lot of statistical analysis to uh, adjust. And, and the conclusion was that RPF had an equal range of movement as RP, but definitely better than LCS knees. And there were other studies which, which showed the same thing as well, that the range of movement with RP or RPF, when you adjust the pre-op range of movement was no different. <clears throat> so, so this is the reason why RPF, <clears throat> what RPF did extra was that it increased the posterior condyle by removing extra bone. And that um, um, was felt that was not needed. And therefore that design went out of work and developed into PS150 where the posterior bone removed was less. And if you see the newer design, a tune RP, it has adopted that. It has removed less number of bone, but the posterior condyle has a better contact area. And therefore I think PS150 has evolved into a better knee. And I think that is why probably it is not available today. I never used PS150. I did PSRP, then RPF, and now a tune RP. And so this is the Attune RP I've been using from 2014 onwards. There are um, overall 209 knees I've done RP. Overall Attune I've done are much more with fixed pairing as well. A lot of them have finished one year and a uh, few have finished even five year. And these are the results. The one year, now these are the new knee society scores. So it comes in a different way. Uh, it is out of 250. So 101 score improved to 191. And objective knee score and subjective knee scores improved significantly as well. And that was even better at five years. Uh, the flexion, 126 pre-op improved to 133. And at five years, remains the same. The satisfaction from the surgery, significantly good, which improves over a period of time. And here are a few case examples. The Varus knees, these are, this is at five and six years from a tune RP, good function, normal gait pattern. This is another patient, one year, five years, again, looking pristine joints. This is another patient immediately post-op and one year with extremely good flexion. Again, you can see because of the post and cam and you know, I think with our tune, the good thing is that the post and cam is sturdier in terms of getting the, the chances of your spin out is lesser compared to the other designs. Although we did not have uh, with good technique, no uh, spin out with PFC, Sigma, RP or RPF. However, if the technique was slopey, I have seen, I have revised some of the RPF particularly done elsewhere, which dislocated and I had to revise them. So you are better off probably with a tune slightly in that terms, or also in terms of getting the plastic with one millimeter increment. 
But what I'm not very happy with in the uh, tune, this thing is the length of the stem, which for rotating platform is fine because the LCS had exactly the same length, of, but for a fixed bearing, that length of stem is something that, that concerns me. Here is one last patient at one year again, extreme range of movement possible with uh, a tune uh, RP with the same as any PSRP knee. We published uh, again this year in uh, clinics in orthopedic surgery, uh, the comparison of patellofemoral outcomes between Attune and PFC Sigma designs. Now this report actually includes both, fixed bearing and uh, rotating platform both. Uh, for this design, I have not separated it uh, for this publication. The only difference was that at three months, Attune had better range of movement statistically compared to PFC Sigma. However, at, at two years, there was no difference. One year and two year, there was no difference in range of between the Attune RP or PFC Sigma RP. Also, <clears throat> no difference in the WOMAC and the new knee society score between the two groups. No difference at all in their scores. The only difference we had was in the incidence of lateral retinacular release was slightly higher with the PFC Sigma design and not with Attune. Maybe because of the narrow processes available, that has gone down. So this is here, Unmesh, your question that, uh, or I, the, the question that are the other companies make the rotating platform? I think Asit, you asked that. So the three common ones which I have used and are still are the, one of the major bulk in the world is the Depu, Johnson & Johnson, uh, LCS, PFC Sigma RP and Attune RP. But there are other companies which are making the rotating platform, Vehicle Papas and LPS Flex, and there are a few French companies, but none is, is widely used as the other ones. What I really want to now talk about in next 10 minutes, if we, um, is about the revision TK. Uh, my use of revision, 80% of my revisions are mobile bearing revisions. And, and I've done about 100 cases of revision TK using mobile bearings. So I'm just going to switch the talk, uh, share the screen with a different talk. Give me a minute. Okay, maybe I'll finish this quickly and then we can have a little discussion if that is um, permitted. So if you look at the National Joint Registry of Australia, since 2003, this was in 2013, there was a 62% increase in the revision rate. And this is from USA, 2007, they published that this revision rate for knee is going to go up and up like that. THA may remain same, but revision for knee and somewhere here, in 2021, we are exactly progressing in that direction. Why use mobile bearing in revision TK? It's because of the success of the rotating platform in the primary total knee, but that's not the only reason. We saw the primary total knee, how good the results are and consistent. It is the success of the hinge knees. And we'll see that in a minute. The, the classical hinge knees became successful only when the rotating platform hinge knees came. So why primary knees failed in 2002? Polyurethane wear and loosening, which I was talking about. In 2006 report, 2010, and even current report, those are the two main reasons. And the rotating platform bearing mobility can reduce the loosening forces by up to 68 to 70%, as I was talking about earlier. And loosening is very rare with rotating platform knee. Now, if you look at the rotating hinges, these are the second generation hinges, which had a very low failure rate. If you look at the fixed hinges, which were the first generation, there was an extremely high failure rate at a very short duration because all the forces of rotation and sliding, et cetera, were being transmitted to the fixation. This study from Ferry Sadat showed that the scores, whether you use posterior stabilized, condylar constrained, or a rotating hinge, the scores remained uniform. So they had a very good scores. In fact, the range of movement was also equal, if anything, slightly better with the hinges. But the most important thing that the patients who had the rotating hinge were the most satisfied patients. 
So I think the rotating platform success in both two categories made people think of using it in revision TK. But that's not the only thing. You need to really also look at other uh, aspects. And that is the outcome of fixed pairing revision knees, which was the common revision knee which was being used in terms of the incidence of the re-revision and reason for the re-revision. And if you look at the, again, Australian registry in 2013, the re-revision rate, re-revision rate was 15% in just five years. That's staggering. And at 10 years, it was close to 20%, more than 20%. And that's not just Australian registry. You look this across the world, Korea, from uh, South America, Europe, everywhere, the similar re-revision rates. That means it is very high. And what was the re -re reason for re-revision with this fixed pairing revisions? Mainly aseptic loosening. Now, why does that occur? Because the post end cam engages itself. See here, if you see in a fixed pairing, there is a post end cap engages here and that transmits the forces down to the tibial fixation. And constantly the tibial fixation is being loaded with the forces that are occurring here. So if you look at this, the same, not only the varus valgus, it's the rotational forces which are now being transmitted to the stem, which is a cause of loosening that occurs. So if you see in a revision situation where you have a stem and all the forces which are being transmitted on the post or the rotation are slowly causing the loosening of the stem. And here are from my practice in five years, three years, seven years, I've had this patients with the fixed bearing revisions with a stem showing extreme amount of movement and loosening occurring. Here the stem is broken. Here the stem is cutting through on the tibia. So there is a stem loosening occurring because of that. What happens in a rotating platform revision? Here, the rotating tibia is rotating along with the plastic and therefore there are no forces transmitted to the fixation and therefore fixation can go on for a longer this thing. This is from Dr. Rick Comistic. <clears throat> uh, this is a fixed bearing in actual vivo kinematics. This is fluoroscopic study where you can see that the post calm impingement is occurring here and there is no mobility of the plastic at all. And this is transmitted to the fixed pairing fixation. If you look at the, if you look at the mobile bearing and look here, the post is rotating along with the femur. And you can see in this particular slide that the, again, both are rotating together and therefore protects the fixation. So this MBT was introduced in year 2008, both together in India and USA. Since then I've used it in 77 patients in 63 revision, other complex primary knees. And I'll talk about the 63 revisions here. Some of them are UKR revisions, which has become quite common in, in current scenario, revising UKRs um, earlier on. <clears throat> knee society scores improved significantly. You can see just like a primary knee. The flexion also significantly, this is a revision setting. An outcome at 10 years, Infection cation, patients had re-revisions in one, lavage and liner exchange needed in three other. And both group had one patient died, but there was no patient of re-revision or lavage or any other thing that was needed for accepting loosening cases. In the index case was infection, the higher chance of something going wrong, aseptic loosening, nothing. There was no mechanical failure, none of this, even infection or aseptic cases, no mechanical failure. I'll show you just some case example. UKR, a two years revised severe lateral compartment arthritis. I use navigation even for all UKRs. This is a mobile bearing, standard mobile bearing, not even TC3 mobile bearing revision. This is at 10 years. Patient remains extremely active. And only thing that the UKR had left behind a patella baha and her knee range of movement is, is limited to about 100 degrees, but, but functional. This gentleman with infection at six months in both primary fixed bearing knees. I revised both together. These are the spacers and this is at one year after having revised both with the mobile bearing MBT revisions. And patient, a doctor himself remains extremely active, completely unaided all his activity. He's currently five years since the surgery. This patient, extremely heavy supracondylar fracture, which was fixed, failed bilateral, Double plating also failed because of infection. I did a two-stage revision with a mobile bearing knee. 
She is very heavy, but continues to remain extremely functional and active. And, and some of these ribs and knees, I'm so confident that they'll go on definitely much longer than, than their primary knees. This is one of the patients who I had operated in 2001. She was only 53 in a fixed bearing knee. And in just nine years, she had osteolysis and loosen. You can see that the tibia, how much amount of osteolysis. She was an extremely active lady. I revised it with a rotating platform knee in 2009 um, with the sleeves. And here at 10 years, she remains pristine and equally active even now. So some of the more complicated cases also with multiple revisions, which had failed elsewhere with infection. This is when she came to me with a crack on the medial condyle, lateral condyle already disappeared. And I've done a distal femur <clears throat> replacement. When you use a distal femur replacement, again, the one you use here is a rotating platform hinge. She remains extremely active. This is at two years. Even a patient like this who had me failed revised, fractured, fixed, which got infected, failed. And that is when she came to me. I did a two-stage complete replacement of femur with a cemented uh, spacer, hip and knee as well, and then revised it with a total hip above and a rotating platform, total knee below with a complete total femur replacement. And she remains, even with a certain situation where she was asked to have an amputation, she remains at least active with her Alzheimer and other issues. Uh, so the rotating platform technology, I think, even in a revision setting, because of the unidirectional movement, it reduces the wear. It reduces wear even on the post and both of them together protects the fixation and therefore loosening does not occur even in a revision situation. I've been using it for more than 11 years with excellent results, no mechanical failure. And with excellent range of movement in some of my patients, even in this third or fourth revision setting. Well, I think I will stop here and, and probably take some questions. If you're Dr. Shiv Kumar, you think uh, uh, we have time for that. Yeah, yeah. We can take questions. I think Unmesh has already unmuted himself. Yes, go ahead, Unmesh. Uh, you can I stop think, uh, sharing, Rajesh. Yes. Yeah. So the question is... Uh, like I also replace all my patellas uh, because what we design we use now now with Atune also I always use uh, replace all my patellas just to avoid any trouble in future. So uh, Dr. Bandegara is asking about patella replacement. So all RP design I still use including Atune I use patella replacement all my patients all my patients. I do the same. However, you know I think the need for replacing patella is probably slightly. Less. Different with femoral designs, and Atune has a better femoral design than uh, PFC Sigma in terms of patella replacement. Yes, and I think a lot of people I know who did uh, patella replacement with uh, uh, earlier design are probably not replacing it now. However, I think I I think that if you do replace patella, you have that much little bit extra advantage in terms of some function and the anterior knee pain. Yeah. Ah, Doctor Rajesh, wonderful, wonderful skills of surgery. My question, I have two questions. One is, in those revision situations, how you get that very tight soft tissue balance to use an RP tibia? And my second question is, if at all, you have to take a three degrees slow without navigation. You must have done some cases without navigation. None. How do you get that accurate? So I, because I think, earlier when we started RP, it was said zero, zero tibial slope. So then it came to three degrees. Does no, it really matter that we have to be very, very accurate on tibial slope? I think you do need to be accurate in, in a way that you don't want a reverse slope. That is one. And you don't want excessive slope. That is two. Reverse because you don't want to have a tight flexion gap. And, and too much because you don't want that instability from front to the back. Um, I think without the navigation to being very accurate is difficult, but you can do it. You just need to spend a little uh, one or two minutes extra when you put your tibial jig, look at it from side. In, your, in a rush, we never do that if you look at it from there. Also, the other thing that you do and which I really like is to look at your native slope. Now, we know that the lateral and the medial tibia both have a different slope. They are, they are not the same slope. So you look at both and you want to 
actually go with the lateral first and just increase a little bit from there. Completely going with medial, you can be in trouble because with the varus knees, which we have mainly, the slope might have changed compared to the native. One more. But I do think that the slope is crucial in your function. One more point is you measure the TBI. If you have a more anterior TBI than the posterior one, you are reasonably okay with the slope. Unless you have a huge anterior and posterior, the slope of the cut portion of TBI. I think you can just the slope of that and sideway with the rod as well. I think both one can go well. But I think with navigation, I always keep two to three degrees of slope. I think three degrees is good enough for uh, RP design, I suppose. You know, if you look Thank at you. The, some of the recent uh, literature on HTO, they say that one of the key thing is maintaining the lateral tibial plateau slope. If you are cut, even, you know, with the osteotomy, if you alter that too much, you have a chance of failure. Long okay. term. Hey, some of your revision cases are really bad and then you could still yeah. do an RP successfully. So, so I do you have I, any incidents of spin out in those cases? No, I have not had. So some of those very no. severe ones, the hinges are the hinges where they will not. But you won't believe I have recently got one patient who had a hinge which had dislocated from the from the TBI itself. But from the from the other other cases, I also thought initially, how can you use mobile wearing in a revision setting? But if you start seeing it, no, it is possible uh, for two reasons. One is that <clears throat> there is already some amount of fibrosis that has occurred in a in a revision situation. And normally you don't need to do too much uh, release. And if you do, you do it very titrated release. And you are still able to get a good flexion balance. Uh, it, it, you'll be surprised. And the other reason is that you, you can use TC3 in a revision setting, which has a more taller post. That means you have that much more stability to give. Okay. Thank you. But you start doing it and you'll realize that you can do it in quite a number of patients. We did in uh, very bad cases, we have used uh, RHK of uh, Zimmer and oh. that actually doesn't require much surgical uh, no, it's uh, challenge because it's a hinge. The hinge has its own way of stabilizing it. Yes, yes. That too is a rotating hinge. Yeah. It's a rotating Yes. I think MBD revision, a, MBD revision tray is a really good tray. MBD, MBD revision tray is very good. Yeah. I've used it in some of the complex yeah. cases also. Yeah, exactly. Instead of using a long short rod, we can use the tray. And that really gives yeah. a lot of benefit, actually. I think we should use it. Like, people should know about it rather than not having used it. I think once they use it, they love it, I think. Yes. But I, I do believe that if you want to use a rotating platform in revision, first use it in primary. Understand a little bit about it. You don't want to straight start. You. I think a lot of RPF I revised yeah. came from elsewhere with a dislocation and instabilities because this a lot of people had not used rotating platform either with LCS or PA, uh, PFC Sigma RP and straight jumped onto RPF because of the high flex in design. And I think that that might not be a very good thing. You might just want to do a primary TK first and then go to a revision TK with mobile bearing. Okay. Yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Sir, we, uh, we have heard the debate, your debate with Dr. Bharat Modi. And uh, at least I must have heard the debate for three times. And the more we listen to the debate, we are more confused. So I, you know, I think all the, poly, all poly versus uh, RP, all poly versus RP. So it, to us, it looks like uh, Maruti 800 trying to compete with the Mercedes. So what is it, sir? Uh, I'm still okay. confused in my mind. I started using RP, and then again, I'm back to all poly. So when I listen to Dr. Bharat Modi, I go back to all poly. When I listen to you, I go back to RP. <laughs> so, but you must know that I use all poly too. I use all poly. You know, I, I think we as an arthroplasty surgeon needs to have all of this, understand them and put them in the right patient where you think is the right indication. The all poly is a great implant, but only in selected patient. The, okay. you, you, if you have a patient with an osteoporotic tibia, not a very good thing to put. If you, um, if you have um, um, 
uh, a situation where there is a defect on tibia. Probably not a very good thing to use because you want to put a rod or even if you don't want to put a rod, it's not a very uh, uniformly load transmitting device. So I think those are the two. And if you do use it, you need to be very good at surgical technique. That is the only device, even today, if I put, I will cement separately. I want to make sure that my all poly TBI is cemented so well that the, you know, and I don't want to try and mix it up with putting the other implants. I mix two packs of cement two or three minutes apart and put them separately. And um, so I think all poly is good, but the number of patients where you can use all poly in our scenario is no more than five, 10 percent, according to me. And, and also, it is ultimately a fixed bearing knee. So what will happen in the second decade or maybe third decade, we don't know. If a patient is extremely heavy, 100 kilo plus, I don't want to put a uh, all poly. There are, uh, there are articles which says that if you have a patient 100 kilos, you better put a stem on the tibia to improve the survivor. So if you're looking at five, 10 year results, go ahead. But if you're for longer, all poly is not for every this thing. Very selected group, correct. And it is cheaper. So why not use that? The RP is very good. I want to put it for every murder. I can't because there are a lot of patients where I've released so much that my stability is not good. And I don't want to create another issue by having a rotating platform instability. So you need to have all poly, RP, fixed bearing, everything in your armamentarium and decide on the table what, what you're going to do. So where you're going to do a fixed bearing metal back, with a bone, good, good, good bone quality, we can go ahead with all poly. Correct. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Right. Yes. And what would be the longevity? Longevity in long term. One other, one other uh, Shiv, one other uh, uh, point is that the alignment is even more critical if you're going to do all poly. You yes. know, you, you want to be neutral. If you're going to be in varus uh, or even little more varus, metal baking might save you, but all poly will not. Yeah, sorry, yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. Sorry, go ahead. You were asking something else. No, no, it's okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Otherwise, we can wind up. Unmesh, Dr. Bandekar, Asit, Shukumar. I think it's all great. All uh, I think most of the points are very well covered by Rajesh. So, uh, 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 yes, sir. Bandekar, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. It is it is well covered, and then uh, no queries. He has answered all our uh, doubts, and uh, I I would just add and comment that all poly is really a good implant. I have been using it for quite some time, and even the patients they don't come for regular follow up because they don't get that what is known as a particle load in the synovium, and then they don't get discomfort in the knee. So one. What an observation I have made when we use a all poly tibia. You know, it's a wonderful implant. It is not Maruti 800, but in long run, it gives the results of Mercedes only. Okay. In selected patients. That's Rajesh, what I'm saying. Yeah. Rajesh, sir. I think with time, we should get an all poly even in a tune. I'm sure it will come. All poly sir, is a good implant. Yes. Uh, 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 I don't know whether you answered this question. Yeah. Why the company is not promoting nowadays? I think you answered it, but I missed the question. Okay, so the... the no, not promoting. I think because the design, once you use, when you design, you think that there are going to be these benefits. But once you use, you realize that what are the plus and what are the minus. So I think with the PFC Sigma RPF particularly, there was quite a lot of bone removal at the posterior condyle and which was not really a very good thing. The other thing which was not very good for me from PFC Sigma RPF is because the femur design was completely different. You couldn't switch on the table between fixed bearing and mobile bearing, which was not very good. So I think it, it went out of the, and as Dr. Ranawad always say that uh, the marketplace will decide, you know, what is good and what is bad. So I think that went out of the, but the good part of the design that you need to increase the posterior condyle area of contact was taken from that design into the newer, like PS150. Again, PS150, I did not like much because the femur again was different. And you should have the same technology for fixed bearing and mobile bearing and should be able to do it right on the table at the last minute. So again, the good part was taken in Attune RP. I think Attune has been designed after a lot of uh, innovations. 
jury is out because it has to test uh, uh, withstand the test of time but but the rp design i'm quite happy with and i've been using it and i think so all those positive things have gone into this design and therefore i, I would think those designs have gone out of i don't know whether ps150 is available or not but pfc sigma rp is still available if you wanted to use only whenever i use rp i use a tune now and um, uh, fixed pairing i still continue to use pfc sigma fixed pairing and attune fixed pairing both is i told you that that stem length does worry me because it has uh, at some point of time in the design evolution people wanted to do a smaller incision and so the tibial stem length was reduced so that it can be put through a minimal inch but i think it does in a long run it is going to matter maybe it will not matter in 5 10 years in the long run it may matter so i'm not sure but for rp it doesn't matter as i told you that there is a uh, because of the load sharing and and the tibial uh, quality of the bone probably it, it uh, lcs had the same stem length rp pfc sigma rp at the same rpf the same and now attune also the same then does the notch lot of bone being taken out in a in a pfc fix pairing design we remove lot of bone from the notch as compared to uh, other companies smith and nephew and zimmer i use all of them but but uh, does that worry you a small medial condylin small indian female uh, you are left with a very small antero especially on the anteromedial side there is hardly any bone once you cut the notch so i think that that's a very valid point particularly in a size 1.5 and 2 you need yes. to be careful you but i still use sigma because all all you need to do is you take a few minutes when you are you can adjust your femoral component a little here and there if the need be and 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 when you're making a cut you ensure that you don't take out more than what you need but i still use even in 1.5 and 2 the posterior stabilized ones and sigma i have used in number of patient i don't think it matters in the long run as long as you don't over over cut your uh, weaken your medial condyle but but i'm sure uh, you must have done hundreds of smith and nephew joints i i did a lot of i did lot of genesis 1 actually i started off in 95 with genesis 1 and i have done some of the legion and other ones uh, oxenium and others but you know yes. they don't remove they don't remove anterior posterior full but they medial lateral they remove even more so i think any posterior stabilized component is going to remove that bone and and at the beginning you will get worried that but in the actual this thing it has not worked out there is one other tip that if you think that that patient you have weakened the condyles then take care of it then and then by putting a femoral stem short cemented femoral stem i might be doing that for 0.1% of my patient or this, this only uh, looking at the uh, notch anteroposterior notch i off late i shifted to this other brands just to preserve i thought they are more bone conserving on the bone okay i have not had that problem i still use 1.5 the and all the brands will remove the they have to remove some amount of bone because without that you can't provide for the post yes so the original two posts were uh, the sigma and the uh, ib which were in the same critical area all others were designed because of the pattern somewhere here and there you know and that that is the most well located posts i think uh, there are yes, no sir. more questions uh, thank you thank you very much dr rajesh punia that was a wonderful you covered the whole the biomechanics and uh, why you are still doing and uh, you have done especially for revision and uh, you have shown excellent results over so many years and lot of follow up and uh, the discussion was also done very useful by dr unmesh mahajan dr shivanand bandekar dr asit chirukar and uh, dr shukumar santpure so i thank all of you last but not least i must thank ashok sham and neeraj bijlani from ortho tv and today the link was managed by supriya of ortho tv i thank all of you and i thank all the viewers have a wonderful night bye bye thank, thank you, you sir thank, thank you very much thank for the opportunity thanks shiv